Have you ever driven somewhere uh, you've never been before at night in a storm? Yes. And how many of you know that that can be like a kind of a nerve-wracking experience? When I was in college, I was coming back uh, from a, a place that I had driven down to, but I have not driven back from. So I was down in Temple, Texas, where my sister and brother-in-law lived, and I'm driving back to Waxahachie, Texas, to go to SAGU at the time, which is now Nelson University, because we've got to get used to that. I'm going to submit for a new degree, so it says the new name. So I'd be like, can I get a new piece of paper, please? Anyways, okay. And I'm driving back, and as I'm headed back, and it's just a straight shot up 35. It's not a difficult drive. I'm driving back, and all of a sudden, it is torrential downpour. And I'm cruising in my 1993 Ford Ranger where my windshield wipers are doing all they can to keep up and not fly off the rails. And and I can't see. I'm constantly behind semis. There's no GPS, and I'm driving alone, and it is a nerve-wracking experience trying to make this happen by myself, nobody to calm me down, I'm in my own thoughts, and that's starting to raise me, like, I'm about to skid out of control, this is the end of my life, I hope everybody is good without me, because this is it, this is where it ends for Ryan, this road is awful, right, and you have that, that kind of crazy experience, and obviously, just in case you're wondering, I lived, and uh, we made it to the end, but on the flip side of that, not too long ago, we took a family trip up to Branson, Missouri. Yes, the Christian Vegas, that's where we headed. And we were there, and on the way up, it took us through Fayetteville, up through Arkansas, and it began to downpour at night in the cold, and it is starting to get freezing, and I'm driving, and the difference was this. I had Lauren and the kids in the car with me. And here's what you'd think. Wow, these are crazier roads. This is, this is a rough deal. And it's swerving and it's back and forth and you've never been here. And I should be more nervous because now I have the responsibility of caring for the rest of them with me. Yet there was a calm because I had Lauren in the front seat and she was pulled up the GPS. And this is truly what was happening. Back when I was in college, we didn't have GPS. And some of y'all are going, you're that old? Yeah, I am. And so now fast forward, we have GPS and we're in the car and we're making this. And Lauren is literally going, okay, coming up, you have a, a hard right turn. The road is going to veer to the right. You're going to, and I, she was literally giving me step by step, not just like stay on this road and in a half a mile, we're going to turn. No, the road is weaving back and forth. And there was this calm. Why? Because now I had someone to share in it with me. And I wasn't trying to navigate it on my own. If I was trying to make that drive by myself in the dark, in the rain, I would have been in a world of hurt because I couldn't just sit here and look what's coming up next, what's happening here, and constantly having to speed up and slow down. And and Lauren's just helping me walk through this thing. And I learned something so valuable and so important in our lives is this We were not meant to navigate this journey alone. We're not meant to navigate life alone, and we're not meant to navigate our mental and emotional health issues alone. That's not the way we are designed. It's not the way we are crafted. It's not the way we are wired. Yet, too often, the thought that we have is simply to keep it to ourselves. When we face mental health issues or emotional health struggles, we tend to keep it close and not share it with others. The problem is, this is not a recommended recipe for success. And in fact, when we begin to isolate and hold it to ourselves, we can actually cause more damage and do more harm than when we bring others in with us. When dealing with mental health, we we keep it close to ourselves. In fact, scientifically speaking, social isolation is actually the worst thing you can do for your mental health. In a study conducted in 2015 by the Royal Society, they found evidence leaking perceived social isolation with adverse health consequences, including depression, poor sleep quality, impaired executive function, accelerated cognitive decline, poor cardiovascular function, and impaired immunity at every stage of life, meaning that this isn't just something that can affect the elderly or the young. This is something that can affect everyone in the world. So what's the point? We're not meant to carry our burdens alone. Peace of mind can't begin until we allow ourselves to be part of the body. But again, often, We fight the issue of embarrassment or the fear of failure or appearing as a failure. And so we 
isolate. And we get this mentality that says, I can do it on my own. And in some things that might work. But in the arena of our mental and emotional health, this is not encouraged or recommended. Studies have shown that that people are lonelier now and have continued to be lonelier. This is, this is a stat that is not just since COVID. This is pre-COVID, 2019. A study was done that, that showed that people were more lonely and isolated than ever before. COVID actually made things worse, and they have not gotten better. This isolation and this, this seclusion. A quote from one of the studies done in 2019 says, Loneliness has been alleged to have the same impact on our life expectancy as smoking 15 cigarettes a day with a risk factor that rivals excessive drinking or obesity. In addition, a lack of social contact can hasten cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, heart disease, depression, and suicide. So when we walk through mental health issues, the answer is not isolation. When we fight depression and anxiety, when we, when we go through issues of dependency and addiction, when we walk through seasons of grief, the answer is not isolation. It only makes things worse. Here's what happens. As we begin to feel embarrassed, we begin to isolate. Isolate leads further and further into despair. I call this the isolation cycle of despair. So here's how this works. It begins with this, you have this mental health issue or emotional health issue. So you begin to isolate out of fear of embarrassment, fear of failure. And in that isolation, we are led then into loneliness because we have now withdrawn. We have rejected others. In our loneliness, it feeds into despair, the lack of hope. What happens in our loneliness and in this isolation is the most damaging thing that can happen. We begin to only hear and perceive our own thoughts. And also, we begin to feed into the lies of the enemy. Beginning to hear the thoughts of, I'm alone, nobody else can understand, nobody will be able to walk through this, nobody's ever going to realize what I'm going through. We begin to pull ourselves away, begin to isolate, and when we do, we find ourselves in a state of loneliness, which leads to greater despair, the lack of hope. And in that place, we begin to think deeper on these thoughts, which leads to further isolation. And this isn't a flat cycle, this spirals downward and deeper into despair. This is what happens when we isolate. This is what happens when we separate. This is what happens when we begin to say, I can manage on my own. I don't need others. But can I encourage you? This is not how God designed us. This is not his plan for peace of mind either. There's nowhere in scripture that says when you're having a bad day, go and sit by yourself and think on this and ponder this in your own thoughts. This is not what the word of God teaches. We're designed for deeply connected relationships. We're created for fellowship with God and with the body. But we can't fully walk as part of the body the way God intended for us to do if we don't get the first and most foundational thing right, and that is we were created, first of all, for relationship, for fellowship with God. And it has to begin there. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says, God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are created for fellowship with Jesus. We're created for fellowship with the Lord. And it begins there. It has to begin there. If we don't start there, isolation then begins at the the deepest and, and hardest levels of being isolated from God. It begins with fellowship with Jesus. This is what we were created for. Jesus made the way to relationship and fellowship with him. And that's first and most important in our journey. And we see the importance of fellowship with him right from the beginning of time. As it says, Adam had fellowship with God. We see that he walks with him in the cool. Like there's this relationship and this fellowship and this connection between Adam and the Lord. And as you continue to see in the garden, 
that the Lord recognizes, yes, he needs fellowship with me, but he needs fellowship with others. In Genesis 2, 18, it says, it is not good for man to be alone. So, so Adam is then given Eve. Eve is now created. There is fellowship with another human being, with a person. So we are created, first and foremost, for fellowship with the Lord, but then we are also created for fellowship with others. It's not good for us to be alone. How many of you can, can relate to that idea? Like, man, when I get alone in my own thoughts, if I'm in a bad place, my thoughts are not healthy. My thoughts are not encouraging. My thoughts are not godly. They don't, they don't lead towards who the Lord says I am. I find myself in a place of, of further despair and brokenness. Why? Because in my isolation, in my loneliness, I begin to believe the lies of the enemy. It's not good for us to be alone. The gospel is first to restore fellowship with God and then to restore uh, fellowship with one another. It not only restores fellowship with God, but it restores fellowship with man as well. And that's part of the beauty of the work of the gospel, is that now as we are restored with the Lord, there is this ease of restoration between relationships. Here. So we are created for fellowship with one another. In Matthew 22, Jesus is asked by the Pharisees, what is the greatest commandment from the law? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God, right? with all your soul, with all your mind, right? We see this. This is the first, but he continues. They don't ask him what's the second greatest. And Jesus' response goes, but the second is like it. And he says, love your neighbor as yourself, right? There is this understanding from Jesus of our need with relationship to the Lord and then our need of relationship with one another. The loving our neighbor aspect, this kindness and this relational peace. We are created for fellowship with the Lord and fellowship with one another. We are created not to be in isolation. There's a beautiful thing that happens when we come into relationship with Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, We were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. There is this unifying thing that happens, this, this creating of the body of Christ that begins and happens when we surrender and give our life to Jesus. The Holy Spirit unites us as the body of Christ, one singular body. Being part of the body is one of the primary expressions of the grace of Jesus. We have others around us. If we exclude the body from our suffering, we don't allow those acting as the hands and feet of Jesus to step in where help is needed. In essence, we reject portions of God's grace for us. My encouragement this morning as we continue through this is be open to find deep relationships with others. You do not want to and do not have to carry the weight of your suffering alone. We are the body of Christ. We need community if we are going to walk in peace of mind. You may be battling depression or anxiety. You may be somewhere so dark in such a deep place. My encouragement is find that person that is in the body, that is part of the body that you can lean into, can fight in. And here's what can happen. There is this beautiful relationship that begins to strengthen and deepen. And then there is the power of prayer that can come in from one another. There is the spoken word of encouragement from one another. Right? There is this beautiful thing that happens in the body of Christ. Here's, here's a couple of quick thoughts. First of all, community in the body is an answer to loneliness. Community in the body is is an answer to loneliness. The tactic of the enemy is to isolate you. This is where the lies of the enemy begin. If he can pull you away, if he can begin to separate you from the, the others and to begin to cause you to think in and of yourself, like, I'm not worthy or they won't understand, and you begin to fight these thoughts of embarrassment, I'm a failure, I, I battle this, nobody else walks through what I'm walking through. All of those things, let me explain to that. All of that is a lie of the devil. That is his tactic. He is the, the king of lies. This is literally what he does. He, he wants to plant things and thoughts in your mind. If he can isolate you, he can leave you in your own thoughts. And what happens, 
when we begin to process in those thoughts and that mindset, we will only fall further into despair. You will see less and less hope. Why? Because you are now believing the lies of the enemy rather than being encouraged by the body. So when we find ourselves in community, we no longer isolate. The enemy doesn't pull us into our own thoughts. We now have some greater clarity. Because I have found this myself. When I isolate in those thoughts, when I get into a, a dark place mentally, or I'm walking through anxiety, or I'm battling depression, if I'm in an isolated mindset, it is harder to even hear the voice of Jesus. Now, Jesus can speak through. Hear me. He, he has the ability and the power and the authority to speak through in, in, in an instant. But there is something that happens in isolation when we begin to believe the lies of the enemy that begins to block out the very voice of Jesus. And so when somebody even comes, if we've been in a place of isolation for a long time, when somebody comes and says, no, let me speak life and encouragement. Let me show you and point you to Jesus. There is this hesitancy and this, this, this resistance that we find ourselves putting up. Listen, hear me. That is a tactic of the enemy trying to take your mind through isolation. So find yourself. Don't isolate. Join into the body. Be in community with the body. You have to have community to combat loneliness. If you, become, if, you, if you begin to become inward in your thinking, you begin to resist the voice of Jesus. The second thing, real quick, community in the body is an answer to fear. There is power in numbers. Power in numbers. I remember as a kid, you go to camp, right? We'd always go to camp in the summertime. And I remember kind of like in my first few years at camp, and you get there, and, and you're trying to play it cool, trying to be tough. I'm the pastor's kid, right? So I've got to be cool. Like, that's just, that's a rule of thumb. So it's just like, hey, you're the pastor's kid. You better be the cool kid and, like, tough. And what I mean by cool is, like, I can't show fear when we go to camp because this is what we do, right? And so as a little kid, you go to camp, and you're ready to go to bed, and all of a sudden the lights go out, and you're like, Ugh. Like, there is this realization of, oh, no, I'm not home, and truth be told, I want my mommy. But I can't show that. And so then you, then you go, like, okay, uh, and you start to have these thoughts of, like, I'm all alone, I'm all alone, I'm all alone, it's dark in here, nobody can see me. And then you have just that hint of light, and you can see in the room, you're not alone. There's power in numbers, right? There's this, this piece that comes of, like, okay, cool, my best friend is in the bed right above me because I wasn't cool enough to get the top bunk. Uh, because of the fear of rolling off. Like, let's just call it what it was. Like, that happened one year, and, like, it scarred me forever. Not to me, somebody else. This kid rolled off the top bunk and, like, comes up the next day, and he's, like, stuck like this, like his neck's hurting. And I was like, not going to be that guy. Uh, quickly learned my lesson vicariously through someone else. Anyways, but here's what it says. Proverbs 12, 25. Let's bring this back to the Word of God. Amen? Amen. I, ooh, we could, an anxious heart weighs a man down but a kind word cheers him up. So community in the body is an answer to fear. As anxiety rises up, somebody comes along and says, hey, it's going to be okay. I got you. Oh, you're doing awesome, right? There is that, that encouragement from the body. There is this connection to community. Why? Because we're not going to isolate. We're not going to hold these things to ourselves, but we're going to find that depth of community where we can be vulnerable and have others come along and help us to carry our suffering. And community is an answer to despair. Have you ever been in a place where there just seemed to be no hope? Man, I have. And I shared that with you last week. So I don't come up here saying these things as somebody who doesn't understand where you've been or what you've walked through. But when we isolate, we only make the problem worse. But community is an answer to our despair. When we lack hope, the answer is not isolation. It's community. The lack of hope is not a small issue in this world. It's everywhere. We are in a world that is fighting the need for hope. In fact, it even exists in the church so I want you to have peace in that, that if you're in a place where there's no hope and you're in a place of despair, you're not alone even in the body of Christ. And we go, how is that possible? We have Jesus. He's returning. This is our hope. And yet it exists, and sometimes it runs deeper 
than just a feeling of a lack of hope. I think of the story of the paralytic man that couldn't get to Jesus. That seems like a pretty hopeless situation. But Jesus is near. He's, he's healing people. And yet he's paralyzed and can't move. Can I tell you that sometimes despair feels paralyzing? When you're lacking hope and there's no hope available and you just go, I know what I need, but I just can't get myself there. So I think of this. So he's there and and the house is crowded and he already can't move. He's clearly, somebody's taking him to his place every day for him to beg and, and, and picking him up at the end of the day. He can't get around on his own. And so what happens? His friends say, we're gonna take you to Jesus. We're gonna take you to Jesus and and we're gonna do what we can. We're gonna do what we have to do to get you to Jesus. And what do they do? They rip the roof off the house. There's a logistical issue there at some point where somebody's gotta fix that, but that's okay. They got him to Jesus. This is what the value of the body does. The body says you're paralyzed by your despair. You're paralyzed by your lack of hope. You're paralyzed by what's hurting. You're paralyzed by what's ailing. Your mind is in a tough place, in a dark spot. You are fighting these things. And the body says, come, let's get to Jesus. We'll stop at nothing. We will pick you up and carry you if we have to. We will carry your mat and we will lower you. We will do whatever we have to do to get you to Jesus because community is an answer to despair. Community is an answer to despair. In his book, The Deepest Place, Kurt Thompson tells how the deeper in relationship we go with others in the body, it will directly relate to our abilities. What he says, the ability to transform our suffering and be transformed by our experience of suffering directly correlates to the degree to which over time we are deeply, truly known by others in the face of it. And he even writes this from the perspective of being a part of the body of Christ. That, that we lean into the body. This is God's design. Peace of mind is often birthed in Christ-centered, deeply connected relationships. Shared suffering leads to hope restored. Shared suffering leads to hope restored. In Jesus, we have the invitation to join in his peace. John 14, 27, Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We can enter into this peace first through relationship with Jesus, but we can experience this peace through the body of Christ. And when we isolate from the body, we begin to push and reject the peace of Jesus away. When we connect to other believers and we go deeper in relationship with other believers, we are able to be encouraged and be lifted up. And can I tell you, we can actually feel the presence of Jesus in relationship with other believers. This is part of the beauty of being in the body. You're brought in and invited into the goodness that is available to you and I. We cannot walk through suffering alone. Isolation is detrimental. Isolation leads to greater failure. As somebody who constantly has to deal with the fear of failure, that is a, you, we'll just turn this into a short counseling session for Ryan Dubos. I fight this as a tendency. I do not ever want to be perceived as a failure. It is a, this is a true thing. I've actually talked to my counselor about this. Like, this is like a real conversation. Just we're pulling back the curtain a little bit here. Like this is something that I fight. And so the, the fear of failure or the appearance of failure causes me to isolate. And can, can I tell you what I know? I'm not alone in this. We live in a world that is persona driven. How do I look in front of others? Do I put up the right persona? Am I perceived the right way, right? And in that, 
we tend to isolate if something doesn't feel right. If we go, this doesn't look good. They're not going to accept this. I'm going to look less than. I'm not going to look good enough. And Jesus says, don't do that. You are created and designed for fellowship with the body. Shared suffering opens the door to hope restored. Shared suffering opens the door to hope restored. Isolation leads to greater suffering. When we share our suffering, it makes way for hope. This is how we break the cycle. If you want to find freedom, if you want to begin to find hope, if you want to begin to find peace of mind in your life, it has to start by sharing our suffering. You have to share it with someone. You have to go deeper in relationship with someone. It does not happen in isolation. It doesn't happen in isolation. One of the beautiful things that we see in all of I, Peyton, to join me is when we receive communion, it acts as a reminder of the broken body of Jesus. So when we come to the Lord's table and, and communion we share the broken body and the shed blood of Christ together. Together, we, we, we partake of his suffering that brought us freedom and wholeness and life. As we share in his suffering together, we share our suffering together in him. This is how he has made his body. It's no accident that the bread symbolizes the broken body of Christ and the church is called the gathered body of Christ. It's through his brokenness that we receive salvation. It's through his brokenness we receive the blessing of his wholeness. Through the brokenness of his body we can find freedom. We can find peace of mind. This morning I want to ask you to stand with me And to take the elements together And before we do I want to stop and pause And I want us to think of those broken places And maybe today you're in a place of, of true hurt Maybe you're in a place of, of true brokenness and, and maybe today you're in a place of, of suffering And your mind is, is, is wrestling And struggling through each moment and each day. Or maybe you're on the other side of that as you stand whole, as you stand free from the hurt and the pain that it is. And you can stand on the goodness of the Lord and say, in his brokenness, I am made whole. It's the beauty that we find and the understanding between the broken body of Jesus and the gathered body of Christ. We each go through times and seasons of suffering. We each face difficulty and hardship. We each walk through hard seasons and hard moments, but we have Jesus available to us. So Father, this morning, God, as we stand here, as we gather together. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll help us to stand in a place of recognition and understanding of your grace and your mercy, of your goodness that we have received. And Father, help us to see where the body of Christ has been an incredible blessing to us. Father, I pray that, that we will fight against the desire for isolation, but that we will join with the body, that we will walk in shared suffering with others. Father, even when it's not our own, we will be available to help carry the burden, knowing that we will need others to help carry our burdens. So Father, this morning, we stop and we remember your body which was broken for us. Lord, you stood and you took the beatings. You carried the cross. 
you hung, you were beaten, you were broken for us. And all the while, you carried our sin and our shame and our guilt, Lord. And and more than that, you died so that your grace may be given, that it may be poured out for our salvation, so that there, there might be life, there might be freedom, there might be wholeness in our lives, Lord. And that includes even our minds. And so, Father, as we receive communion together, as the body gathered. Let us not miss your brokenness for our brokenness. Let's take the bread. his blood that was shed for us. Father, your grace was poured out. Your blood shed to cleanse and to wash, to redeem and to justify. So, Father, this morning we, we gather as the body, united together, and we say thank you for your blood. Thank you for the blood that was shed for us, that was given for us, so that we might be washed white as snow. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, let's take the cup. God is in the business of turning our brokenness into blessing. He is in the business of restoration. He is in the business of, of, of making what seems impossible possible. He is in the business of taking your deepest hurts and replacing it with hope. Can I tell you one other thing? God does not waste anything we walk through. I'm a firm believer that if, if my story and, and, and my suffering and my, and my difficulty and my problem, if anything that I've done is, is able to be used for the glory of the Lord, so that anything that I've walked through, any season that I face, if it allows someone else to grow or to have clarity or find healing or find freedom, then, then I look at that and I say, thank you, Lord, for not just removing it, but sustaining me through it, for giving me the grace and the strength necessary so that it can be used. This is how the body works. If I go through seasons where where I am broken and hurting, I can come along with somebody else who helps me to find restoration and healing by the grace of God, by the power of the Spirit, and I come on the other side of that, and now there is someone else that comes along, and they go, man, I'm walking through this, and I go, I've been through it. This is how the body works. It's by the grace of God, by the leading of the Spirit, by the empowering of His people as we walk and work as the hands and feet of Jesus. So, Father, this morning, we thank you, God, for your goodness and your mercy. God, I thank you for your love and for your grace. Lord, that I get to be part of the body of Christ. Lord, that we get to gather together as the body. To be used by you, Lord, and then to lean on others. to help others find wholeness in their brokenness, to find strength and to find grace as we gather together and operate and work as the body of Christ. I pray, Lord, that your hand will go with us. Lord, I pray that as we walk from this place today, 
Lord, I, I pray over any mind or any person that is walking through the difficult and the hard seasons. I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus that they won't isolate, that they won't withdraw, Lord, but that they will find the strength necessary to go to someone and to say, will you walk with me through this? Where we can be the body together. We thank you for it. We give you glory. We give you honor for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. This morning, as, as you prepare to go, if you need prayer and you're saying, man, I'm in a spot. I would love to pray with you. I would love the opportunity to pray with you. And also my encouragement is if you say, I need community, I need to be around godly people who are pointing me in the right direction and to go deeper, my encouragement is, and listen, this isn't the only answer. I don't say this like we are the end-all, be-all, but join a small group. Get connected in a small group. Find depth of relationship there and begin to grow with those people and, and walk with them. The other side is connect with somebody here in the house. Go to coffee. That's as much as a a godly moment as any where you're just sharing in in the grace and in the the peace of God over a cup of coffee or grab dinner. But find someone, connect with them, and be willing to say, hey, will you help me in this? Will you walk with me in this? And then my encouragement to the rest is to say, maybe you're not going to somebody asking them to come with you to help. Be willing to help carry the burden. Be willing to help carry the burden. This is how the body works. This is how the body works. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, blessing over this house. I pray, bless their marriage, bless their family, bless their work. I pray, God, that your hand will rest over uh, all that they do this week. Walk with them, walk with them, walk with them. Lord, let them know your nearness. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Have a great week. The best is yet to come.